pleasure of introducing you to Barlow today. Um, just a little bit of background on how I met Barlow, actually. We, we met at a, a creative mixer out networking one night, and that was probably three and a half years ago. Um, and Barlow's actually been working with Brand Union, um, Andy Reynolds and his team over at Brand Union. Um, and actually, it kind of comes full circle because when I had to put together a video to prove to the headquarters at Creative Mornings why Hong Kong should have a chapter, um, I needed a video. I needed a professional video, um, and I needed really good content for the video. Um, and Andy Reynolds and Barlow actually are featured in that video, and they let me use their amazing Chinese New Year artwork um, to go into that. <laughs> so, so, and now, if, um, two years later, and we are here today with, with Barlow. Um, he's an extremely talented graphic designer, branding designer, packaging, illustrator, artist, um, and so, by day, working at Brand Union, but by night, um, making Hong Kong more beautiful with his graffiti and street art. So um, please give Barlow a warm welcome. someone asks you uh, to make a talk on the topic weird, you always wonder, because they think that you're a weirdo, because they think that what you're doing is weird. And by the way, I took that as a compliment, and I said, okay, fine, let, let's give it a try. And, uh, and as you may have realized, I'm actually not a native English speaker, um, so I'm actually, despite the fact that I use the, the word weird very often, uh, I wasn't exactly familiar with it, and so I went to check it out. And, uh, and as you can imagine, there is uh, like uh, the kind of uh, obvious meaning of uh, oddness or something that is unusual, disturbingly different. Um, but in the meantime, I was like uh, searching for the meaning. I actually also bumped into the etymology of the word, which I actually found uh, extremely fascinating. Um, and I actually discovered that the, the word weird derives from the Old English weird, which used to mean fate, chance, fortune. He had a pretty similar meaning in uh, Proto-Germanic, uh, and in Proto-Indo-European, the word vert, which is the origin of the word weird, um, actually meant to, to turn, to win, to, to become. And so all of a sudden, you know, the, the word weird started assuming uh, uh, a much more fascinating meaning. Uh, however, uh, the, the contemporary meaning of the word weird uh, was established in the Middle Ages, uh, where the, these three ladies, which are the the goddess of fortune, the fates, uh, used to be called uh, the Weird Sister. And uh, since in popular imagination they actually used to be quite odd looking, then like the meaning of the word shifted from meaning fate uh, to become somehow like the, this, describing like the physical appearance of the three goddesses. And if you are not familiar with the uh, uh, European pantheon, this is how they look more or less right now. Um, and I thought that this kind of uh, dualism between, uh, you know, somehow a kind of a superficial aesthetic quality and uh, uh, a deeper meaning uh, is, uh, is quite uh, uh, actual also in the, in the creative industry. I mean, we see it all the time when um, uh, people are just using in communication uh, element of awareness uh, just to catch the attention very easily without actually necessarily generating any content or any value or any benefit for humanity, um, but uh, the, the way I would like um, the way I would like to angle the, the idea of awareness uh, is when actually uh, elements of awareness uh, uh, work as a virus, uh, like an external element introduced into a context of normality and somehow contaminating that and changing that context forever. You would actually be surprised that, uh, um, actually, not, not very surprisingly, but uh, cultural contamination is actually uh, something that has been happening over and over um, in the centuries in our history. Uh, just to give you one example, um, when in 1860 Japan opened to the world, uh, Americans thought that they were going to sell them a lot of guns. Uh, but uh, what they didn't expect was that actually bringing back the Japanese culture into the West, they would have changed the Western culture forever. 
So what you see here in the picture is the Japanese pavilion at the World Expo in Paris in uh, 1867, so seven years later. And it was about the first time that the, the, the West got actually exposed to the Japanese culture. And Paris just went nuts. I mean, all the artists started having, started being very influenced by Japanese art, uh, using the pattern, looking into the techniques. Uh, uh, but it also affected somehow the lifestyle. So there were all of these like uh, circles of rich lady having their afternoon tea party, dressing a kimono because they thought it was very chic. Um, but probably uh, among like the different uh, um, contaminations, the more um, impressive is the one that happened in architecture. So if you think about uh, the, uh, the architecture in Europe in the, uh, in the 19th century, um, that was the peak of uh, the Art Nouveau. Everything was floral, everything was decoration and color, and, uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden the, the Japanese influence came in and they taught us that actually you, know, you can have a door that is very light uh, in paper and very simple, and it's fine to have a wall even if it is not decorated. And uh, you know they, they planted a seed, and, and that virus actually grew into uh, into the Western culture, and eventually, um, you know, gave birth to the to the or at least influenced heavily the the birth of, of the modern architecture. And right now, when we look at uh, modern building uh, all over the world, uh, we don't find them weird, and that's because somehow the system absorbed the element of weirdness, absorbed the virus, uh, and the contamination became permanent. Um, so you know, this, this is just to show how like uh, an element that at uh, uh, some point is considered as weird can actually be developed and become uh, something else, a creative innovation. Uh, and of course, like right now, I just give you an example on a very high level, like you know, like a, an influence that actually shifted completely the perception of an entire uh, culture. Um, but this can actually also happen on a much smaller scale, uh, on a personal scale, and this is what happened personally to me when I moved to Hong Kong. So, uh, as, uh, as Juliet uh, uh, said, uh, I am a uh, uh, full-time graphic designer, but I also do street art, uh, illustration, graffiti, uh, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but it hasn't been always like this. Um, you'll be surprised. When I was in Italy, actually, I was doing much less stuff. I actually started painting in the street when I was uh, 15, but at the time my practice was simply to go uh, on the web, find an image that I like, and then you know just go in the street and with the, the spray cans try to reproduce it. It was um, it was something fun to do. It was a fun way to get in trouble with my friends, uh, but it was pretty much a game. Uh, and in fact, when I started studying uh, uh, design in university, I you know, somehow redirected all of my creative energy into that new practice. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I, I stopped painting because I didn't need to do that anymore. Uh, but then I came to Hong Kong, uh, and then I was uh, completely overwhelmed by all of the diversity that I found in this city. I mean, there is the, the urban jungle sitting within an actual jungle, and then you can move a couple of kilometers and end up in, a, in the most local village and have a totally different kind of experience. And coming from a small town in Italy, I mean, everything in Hong Kong was literally weird for me and different and new. Um, and so, uh, you know, the need to go out and paint actually came back to me and really hit hard. Um, and as you can imagine, like doing street art in Hong Kong is uh, probably not, not not the easiest thing, um, particularly looking for, for spots to paint. And that's how I ended up uh, in abandoned places. Um, now, I have uh, uh, a very soft spot for abandoned places in my art because, uh, um, well, not only because, of course, as you can imagine, they have uh, a beautiful big surfaces uh, uh, where I can paint, you know, being relatively safe. Um, and most importantly, I can paint whatever I want. Uh, but also because uh, I think that this place is really all the uh, charm. Uh, and there is a really some kind of mystical energy in, in, in this kind of places. Uh, so what you see in the, in, the, in the picture here is the ATV abandoned building in Saikun. This is the first place where I went. And this is a, a series of beautiful pictures took by H.K. Orbex. So, um, the story of this place is, uh, is, very, is very funny, and it kind of gave me uh, an idea about what to expect in Hong Kong. 
you know, the place was supposed to be abandoned. The first time I went there, I was with a full friend of mine. It was during Chinese New Year holiday, and we went there to find 30 more people already inside. <laughs> So there were a bunch of kids on the rooftop that were, uh, you know, drinking beer, smoking cigarette, tagging secretly from their parents. Uh, then there were two girls fully dressed in cosplay and a guy that was taking picture of them. Uh, I met uh, Jason, which is the uh, co-founder of HK Walls, who was taking picture, and I met another artist called Veri Massa. Uh, and then the rest of the people were playing big again, and I'm talking about like a bunch, maybe of 20 people fully dressed, uh, ready to, to play. I was like, okay, well, this is, uh, this is pretty, pretty interesting, and, and that actually became just the first of a, of a series of anecdotes about uh, uh, abandoned places. Um, another thing that I really like about abandoned places is the way they affected my behavior. Um, so this is uh, um, probably the most dangerous places I've ever been to. This is the abandoned airport uh, on the Puntong waterfront. Actually, this building by now has been taken down for sure. Uh, and I can tell you, like, this place was really, really scary. It was totally, I mean, really, really fucked up. But, and uh, I can tell you, the floor was, like, oblique. Now, Michaud, I am not a particularly reckless person or one of those brave that would enter in, in anything. Uh, but I don't know, like when I am in this kind of situation, my, my behavior change. And that's one of the reasons why, why uh, I like going there. Um, but for example, here yeah, we were painting on the rooftop. And to, to access the rooftop, we had to climb on that abandoned piece of furniture over there and literally sneak through the window, like, uh, you know, really on, 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 on the means. And uh, there is really uh, also like a physical component into it. And again, since I'm also not a very athletic person, that, uh, I don't know, that, that's really something um, different for me. That's one of the reasons why I love it. And uh, the last example I want to give you of abandoned building uh, is a place uh, I've been to like very recently. This is the last abandoned building that I did. This is not in Hong Kong, this is in Italy. Um, and when I went back for my summer holiday, um, I was invited by the blogger uh, Urban Life to participate to a project called Rurales. Uh, this is the countryside of Emilia, a region in, uh, in uh, uh, cent central Italy. And, uh, and the guys uh, living uh, nearby to this countryside uh, were quite upset by the fact that the agricultural industry have been changing the kind of cultivation that this place have been doing. I mean, these are places that have been having like very traditional um, vegetables and fruit uh, uh, that kind of shape their countryside. And then, because of uh, export reason, a lot of big corporations have started moving all of this uh, diversity into uh, cultivating uh, mice, uh, which apparently is much better for the, for the export. Um, so what the guys of Rurales are actually trying to do, uh, first of all, um, is somehow you know, repurpose uh, these abandoned farmhouses, uh, um, try to raise awareness uh, to the general public about uh, this, this uh, change in the, in the countryside, uh, but also you know, try to give uh, a new life uh, to these places. And uh, on the side of I mean, the scope of the project, uh, this is really one of those uh, uh, situations where I really felt transported by the, by the environment, by, by the place itself. Um, I have to say, I don't believe in uh, creative journals or sketchbook. I sketch really, really little. I mean, I'm not the kind of person that, uh, I don't know, see a beautiful flower and stuff like that. It's, it's really not, not how I work. But, uh, you know, in this situation, I actually did. That, that, that's me sitting there with, uh, with my friend uh, Andrea Cashi that collaborated with me on the wall. And, um, and even if actually I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to play, then you arrive in front of the wall and then you understand that whatever you thought before is totally irrelevant. And then you just sit there and take the time to understand the place, uh, to understand what you're going to do. Um, and again, I mean, painting a wall like this is quite challenging without cherry picker, without toll ladder. Right? The, the physical component in it is, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite challenging. And we painted all of this like with an uh, extension pole and brushes stick on, on the top of it. Uh, but 
at the end of this two days painting, uh, you know, like I, I think that uh, I, I felt that this place somehow had changed me a little bit. I was also happy to see that uh, um, somehow I contributed uh, in the evolution of, of this place as well. Um, and so looking back uh, in the kind of uh, practice that I've been doing in the past three years uh, in Hong Kong, uh, I realized that actually every wall, uh, every project I participated to as a, is a story. Um, is a, it's not something that I've been researching. You know, like um, Pablo Picasso used to say, artists uh, don't search, artists find. And there is a huge difference between the two things. And, and everything that I've been doing in, in the past three years uh, is not the result of uh, you know, me sitting in the studio, going through internet of references, which for sure is, is a useful tool. But uh, I think it's, it's uh, you know, the sum of all the, of all the experiences that I had, the places where I've been, the people that I've met, that somehow uh, changed me, and, and things that I introverted and then returned uh, onto the wall. Um, and in the same way, I also realized that my way of approaching uh, a new surface is actu actually works pretty much in this way, and it's a kind of process that I call alchemical. So probably uh, when most of you hear the word alchemy, you think about some weird proto science that tries to transform iron into gold. Um, actually, that's a mistranslation from, again, the Middle Age. People in the Middle Age were super literal, like clients. They had no sense of Alchemy actually is a, is a philosophy uh, that goes uh, way, way back uh, to ancient Egypt, but you can find traces of it uh, in China, in Greek culture, in Arabic culture, even in the Kabbalah. And uh, when in alchemy uh, people talk about transforming the iron into gold, they're not intending that like, physically, they are they're intending that metaphorically. And, uh, and actually, you know, uh, alchemy is, uh, is uh, somehow this, uh, this philosophy, this mindset uh, about transformation, about uh, uh, the matter becoming something else, uh, unleashing its true potential. And I also find quite interesting that the original meaning of the word weird uh, somehow, you know, match a little bit with, uh, with, uh, with this description. And anyway, this is the kind of approach that I try to add uh, on any kind of a project that I do. Um, just two more examples. Um, when a couple of, uh, of uh, years back, uh, I had the chance with Brandino and Ogilvy to work on the project for, for, for Pizza Art, I was given a, a fantastic assignment. So um, someone had the brilliant idea to uh, put a lens into uh, a pizza box, and by doing that, uh, transforming the box into a projector by putting your phone inside, then like in a very, very dark room, the, the, the box will work as a projector. And, uh, and my assignment was very easy. Okay, like, you know, we have an idea for, for a product. Now it's about time to design it. You have to make it look really, really cool. I was like, yeah, this is great. Because of course, the idea was, was fantastic. Um, but you will be surprised how, how much at the beginning I was actually struggling, trying to make uh, uh, something cool. Uh, and that's because actually trying to make something cool per se is really pretty, pretty much impossible. I think that you always need to have a, an angle of things. And so that's why uh, I kind of like to sit back and try to look at the things from a different perspective. And I actually realized that uh, what I was looking at was uh, an object that was going through this process of transformation. It was uh, this object that was becoming something else. So with my design, I actually had to help uh, um, somehow be, being a facilitator in this transformation process. Um, and after I started like uh, um, angling the, the issue like this, it, it became something completely different. And so we decided, and, and then it started becoming very easy and very natural to, to start developing a series of illustration that are based on movie genre and they somehow play with the, the, the lens. And I did the one uh, anchovy Armageddon there in the bottom, but I involved uh, three more friends to do the others, uh, um, Caratos, Parents, Parents, and Mark Goss. And it's not the case that all three of them are also uh, street artists, because I think that uh, in the way that the illustration somehow wrap the surface, there is uh, somehow an attitude of working on uh, weird surfaces, angle, and, and stuff like that. But actually, pretty much everybody working in the project uh, realized uh, what we were doing. And, and then you can see a lot of very clever little solutions, again, really to, to, to um, follow up with this 
process of transformation of the product itself. And I think that eventually this is what uh, you know, resulted in a quite solid uh, uh, project. And, uh, and the logo, which is you know, the brand identity of the thing, was actually the last thing that we did. After, the, after we completed the illustration, after we completed everything, when already the object had a character, we just basically put a label on it that, that would match with what we had done. Um, and the, the last project I want to talk to you about uh, is about the project I did in Causeway Bay. Um, before I told you about uh, um, you know, places that have a soul or an object that can have a soul, um, but sometimes uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very funny where like, really the spirit of a, of a place is really embodied into a person. And this is what happened in this project. So in the picture with me, there is Freddy. Uh, Freddy uh, owns a bar in, um, in Cosway Bay called Brecht Circle. Uh, and what you can see on the right uh, is a caricature portrait of uh, Hitler, which is in this bar, sitting next to a caricature portrait of Mao and Lenin. And this is just to give you, uh, sorry, not Lenin, Stalin, uh, just, just to give you an idea of uh, the kind of character we're talking about. I can tell you definitely a strong, uh, uh, a strong personality. And, uh, and a couple of years back, before the Umbrella Revolution, uh, my, my good friend Mice um, told me, hey, I have this, uh, this friend in Cosway Bay. Uh, he has a bar. And he has this uh, very nice uh, outdoor wall. He would like us uh, to paint it. I was like, oh, wow, this, this is great. The, the location is fantastic. Um, and I said, oh, but you know, he's a, he's a bit political. He would like to have something political painted. I said, OK, fine, no problem with that. And so we decided to paint uh, uh, this wall, which you know is a, a red wolf representing China, grabbing this little girl with a, like a Hong Kong flag on the earth. Uh, he was very, very happy. And actually, if you want to know the truth, in the original sketch, the little girl was holding an umbrella. And that was before the umbrella revolution. And I told him, nah, an umbrella. Who would have reused an umbrella to protect themselves? <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, I think if we did it, we would have, like, the story of this war would have been completely different. I, I regret it so much. But anyway, like, this is what we ended up painting. Um, we were happy with it. Uh, Fred was very happy with it. Uh, and actually, the, the wall had uh, quite, a, quite a good run. He stayed up for four, six months, which for street artists, it's quite good. Um, but then, in the meanwhile, Umbrella Revolution happened. Uh, and then one day, Freddy arrived to the bar uh, to find a walkover in white. Uh, and a letter from the lawyer of the building management saying, if you try to do that again, we sue you. <laughs> and uh, just one week after that, uh, he received a surprise inspection um, and that found out that uh, his bar, uh, part of his bar had been built illegally. And consider Freddy has been renting the place for 20 years. And apparently, this uh, abusive building goes back to 30 years ago. Um, anyway, with, with no choice left, he basically had to close the place for four months and go through renovation. Uh, and after this renovation, he had lost his kitchen. Uh, and, and I think that for him, this is really a big stab in, at the back, because he was an amazing chef. It's a funny story. When we finished to paint this wall, it was like uh, on midnight. And he just put a table out there in front of the wall, and they cooked us an amazing steam fish, and we were eating like literally in the street in front of the wall, and, and it was and it was great. So you can imagine, I felt really really sorry, and and this is basically what is what was left of his uh, of his kitchen, this uh, kind of uh, uh, backyard uh, without ceiling because apparently the ceiling was the uh, the illegal part, right? And so when he asked me to, to paint something there, maybe also because I felt that partial, partially responsible for you know, the bad luck that he had, he had been having, uh, I was OK, great. This is a, a great opportunity. And once again, he was like, oh, please, I would like to have a, uh, something political. Um, and, I, and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. But it, because it was like, oh, you know, this is actually inside the bar, uh, so nobody can, can erase it this time. I was like, OK, fine, this is, this is great. Uh, and, and once again, I thought, like, this is a, this is a great uh, opportunity to actually try to, um, to insert an element of weirdness in here, but an element of change as well. 
So this is uh, how I created the, the world upside down. Uh, this piece is inspired by an old folk story that was born during the French Revolution. Uh, basically, uh, all the poor of Paris were imagining um, this, this place, this land, uh, where um, the poor are in charge, and the kings and all the tyrants would actually uh, go under the, the justice, right? Because at the time, uh, they were pretty much aside from, from the justice system. And so I imagine, you know, like uh, a place where the, the floor becomes the sky, and this kind of predator tiger are wrapped into these uh, leaves that just by chance look like yellow ribbons. And, and I think, like, uh, uh, you know, the, give a second, second birth to the place. And, uh, and very funny, this is an image I received just, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. No, oh, this one. Um, now, to me, to me, this is probably like the, 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 the most weird thing. I don't, I don't know how to react to this. But to think like, you know, a word that in the real, in the real world has been covered, it doesn't exist anymore, somehow, somehow keeps living in these uh, parallel dimension, which is Pokemon Go. <laughs> it, it's really, really odd. And, and you know, if there is a, any sort of lesson from this is that uh, uh, rather than make uh, work that is weird, uh, probably it's much better to make work that is spirited. Because if the work is spirited, somehow it sticks, even if not in the shape of form that you imagine. Thank you. <laughs> Q&A. Um, any questions? My question is, um, the building that you showed with the room that sticks out, where is that? The square, the... There was a building at the start, the concrete building, and the room sticks out in a very square and symmetrical whereabouts, is that? talking about this building. No, no, no. Japanese. The Japanese oh, inspired. Uh, that was the, the, the Japanese uh, uh, pavilion uh, at the um, Paris World Expo in 1867. And the one after that. Yeah. Ah, sorry. That is, uh, I don't know exactly where it is, but that was designed by Walter uh, Gropius, um, one of the founders of the Bauhaus. And I was actually looking, this one, yeah. Yeah, I was um, this was actually the kind of the best picture I could find uh, of, uh, of a building that is representative of, uh, of modernism. I have to be honest, I, I don't know where, where this is. <laughs> I can tell you that this is from Walter Gropius. So for sure, by, if you look like Walter Gropius architecture, yeah. you will bounce in the picture and, and you, will, you can search where it is. Next question? <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, I followed HK Wars for the uh, uh, first uh, Taiping Sand Square and then the uh, some Shepo projects for about a few years and also the Civil War. So. And also I dropped by, there was a, a place, an uh, abandoned bus station, a factory station in Guntong, where the boys one night raid and do their, all their uh, parties and then graffitis in protest of you know, the land intestines. I just wonder where else would you like to go after these? Because I think about Thai Kok Choy, maybe East Khao Lund. Would there be any possible places where you can you know, pursue? Yeah, there are actually uh, a lot of places. Uh, I actually have my personal push share of abandoned places, which is actually my friend Mice, you've seen in the picture with me. Um, he's actually great. He's the, the guys that discover all the abandoned places in the city. I think that the, abandoned, the, the ATV abandoned building was originally discovered by him before anyone else had been there. That's because he is uh, 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 an ex-military and he can climb literally on everything. <laughs> I, rem I remember the first time when I met him, we were in, we were in uh, a, again around Kuntong Nantau Kok, that, that is full of, of abandoned places over there. We go there quite often. And, uh, and you know, and there was like this very tall wall and it was like, okay, give me your hand, give me your hand. It's, Boom, 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 and like really, really, really tall for kids. And then give me say, okay, now it's your turn. Say, say you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> say, okay, you know what? Take this. Go inside. There is a fence. You break it, and I and I enter from there. 
and, and that's, that's how I ran. Uh, but yeah, um, I don't know, I think it's just curiosity. You, you sometimes pass in front of a, of a building that look abandoned. Uh, it takes a little bit of guts to go in there and just check it, check it out how it, how it is. But uh, uh, Kuntong, Nantel Kok, full of, uh, of abandoned building, really a lot. So yeah, but thank you for the suggestion. Not really a question, but uh, the pizza box idea. I saw yesterday, I think it was Mashable, someone's turned pizza box into DJ equipment. Oh, really? uh, just a flat pizza box, you might be able to Google that. Oh, well, yeah, and okay. I think this weekend at PMQ there's a box, like Makerspace are doing, turn cardboard into interesting stuff. Okay. So, worth Very cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Hi, Bala. I've been to Reggio Media, so I know what it's like. It's very, your picture is very true to what it's like. So two questions, one, what made you move to Hong Kong? And second question, is there anywhere else in the world that you'd like to go and replicate what you've done here in another part of the world? Okay, uh, question number one, very easy to answer. I moved for her, this girl. <laughs> Why I moved to Hong Kong, and, uh, and I, I keep saying that she's the, also the reason why I'm staying here, uh, but that's actually not completely true because uh, in the meantime I've been in Hong Kong, I actually, actually somehow it's drawn on me. Um, and you know, coming from Italy is a, is a bit different because we have a really, I don't know, I think I have embodied a sense of what is proper beauty. We, we see it in our streets, we have beautiful architecture that go goes back in time, right? And, and when I arrived to Hong Kong, my first reaction was, wow, this place is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, like, I, I don't mean it in an offensive way, because anyway, since then, I've been living here. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I, I, I'm really honest when I, when I talk about the fact that when I was in Italy, I had stopped painting. I wasn't doing all of this stuff. So all of, maybe even the ugliness, I don't know, like the diversity, what I've seen, and really, really uh, helped me to do what I, what I do. So part of me is not, not scared of moving, but I, I, I'm almost not ready. I also I almost think that I haven't, uh, um, I haven't had enough of this uh, yet before I decide to move uh, somewhere else. And actually just looking at, uh, you know, around the world, uh, is, is, there isn't any place where I would like to, you know, just just go to move and replicate this experience. But for sure, like I would like to, to travel a little bit more because uh, um, actually right now it's quite popular for, for, for street artists to, 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 to move around and you know be invited in, in different festivals. There are different ways you can do it. Probably rather than doing the festivals, I would prefer to go more on, on personal trips. Uh, but it is, is, you will be surprised how easy it is. For example, I, I went to New York in, in May and I wanted to paint in New York, uh, and uh, literally the only thing I had to do was to, to call a friend and say, hey, you know anyone in New York? Said, oh yeah, I know this person. And email, contact the person, and like, you know, three weeks later I was in New York painting in the Bronx. Uh, so you, you just have to, I don't know, some, somehow take, take the initiative. Uh, and, and then it's relatively easy. It's a very small community worldwide, so it's okay. Anyone else? Hi. Stranger. Um, so you say that, it's quite interesting that you say, you know, Hong Kong inspires you and sort of encourages you to be weird in your personal work, right? So in the, in the street art and in your illustrations, but on the flip side to that, do you find that it can somehow restrict you in your commercial work as a city, culturally, if you know what I mean, from a client point of view? Uh. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, I think that probably the fact that I have the restrictions on the commercial side is also what pushed me to go in the street and do my, my things. I think if I, if I had the, the chance to do like a really, really creative uh, uh, design work for client, like if every project was like Pizza Hut, maybe I wouldn't have the need to, to, to be going in the street and, and doing what I want to do. Uh, but you know, again, I, I, I'm happy that I, that I took back the, the brush, so like, uh, uh, I hope I won't leave it again, I won't be leaving it again, at least not anytime soon. I think of course, uh, of course it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, depressing sometimes to face uh, uh, people that, uh, 
have a really different sense, uh, not just aesthetically, but in general, uh, creatively. Um, but there is opportunity there as well. I don't know. I think on me, it, it kind of uh, worked uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a challenge. Like, OK, so this place is really, really trying to, to tone me down. Then OK, then I have to, to step up, but just not in the conventional way. One more? Anybody else? Hi. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Please give Barlow a round of applause. Thank you so much. So, we just have a few announcements. Um, as you may have, some of you may have seen on the EDM, we've partnered with global tech education company, General Assembly. Um, they are offering Front Row Access, which is an online education platform, to everyone who's created a profile, with a beautiful picture, obviously, um, on the Creative Mornings website. So if you've registered, hopefully you're already on there, and you'll have three months access to learn from any of those programs, so that's pretty cool. Also, a quick thank you. Um, given the theme was weird, um, we have EXO. Um, we have cereal bars, protein bars. They're made of crickets. Anyone game? Anyone going to try one? Did anyone try one yet? Yeah. Were they good? Yeah. Yes. All right, highly recommended. Let's eat crickets today and get weird. All right. And can I ask Amy, um, one of our volunteers, Amy, we, so we had a volunteer meeting a, a few weeks ago. And we're talking about our challenge which come, with coming up with giveaway prizes. Um, that would be fun. Um, and actually, so Amy works with Lenovo, and they had an amazing, um, generous giveaway for, for a very lucky winner today. Um, but you're going to have to work for it, I must warn you. Um, but Amy, do you want to just tell them what the giveaway is real quickly? Okay. Let me uh, just introduce myself. So uh, I'm Amy. I work at Lenovo on the global smartphone team. Uh, this is my third Creative Mornings, and uh, I immediately felt the energy in the room um, my first time, and I always left inspired, so I asked Juliet if I could um, volunteer in any way, help out. Um, so she told me the theme was weird this month, and we happened to have launched a campaign called Good Weird last year. Um, so you can see these examples, they're products that are kind of weird, but they're weird in a good way. Uh, so we also try to make products that way, like we, we have a, a PC, for example, that has a hinge that you can kind of rotate 360. So, so today I'm giving out a prize, um, it's the Lenovo Fab Plus, uh, it's called Fablet actually, that's our <laughs> Fab, uh, it's a phone and a tablet combined in one, and uh, it's a pretty good phone launched last year. Um, a 6.8 inch screen, uh, pretty good battery life. <laughs> so anyway, um, Juliet's gonna uh, tell us what you have to do to earn it. <laughs> so we're always trying to think of new ideas for you know, audience engagement, and obviously weird is an amazing topic to have some fun with, and it's Friday, um, so why not? Um, but basically, hold on, oh. George? <laughs> Help. If you have wigs or if anyone has any of those, please put them on. Please pass out the wigs and anything else wacky sound. We're going to have to turn it up. Okay, so a lot of you are probably familiar with this song. You have to dance weird to win the fun, all right? So I want everyone to get up, and I want to see the weirdest ring and dancing possible on Friday. So please stand. Obviously, if you're not getting you can at least do something like this. Do something. Wear a wig. Let's go. Everybody. Someone's got to get weird in here. Oh, we got someone moving! We got movement! We've got movement! Woo! Thank <laughs> you. 